All right, we are going to resume here. Uh, so uh, Bob Freemuth uh, wrote and asked if I was going to go into the hurry up offense. And uh, I think it's going to be more akin to uh, watching Patrick Mahomes trying to escape from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers front four. So um, in any case, uh, uh, what's going to happen for this next hour uh, is that uh, we're going to go through some uh, slides that Ken and I put together uh, with the takeaways. Um, yeah, the, the, the Tampa Bay didn't take it easy on Mahomes Hoffman. Why should I? Um, so uh, Ken is going to uh, be um, editing slides with the content as we go through. We do have a lot to cover. So um, uh, I'll, I'm going to be fairly uh, draconian about moving us forward and would ask that if there are some minor comments or edits, um, pop those into the chat or the Q&A. We will definitely pick those up. But if there's some major themes that we either got wrong or um, uh, missed, uh, that's where we really want to make sure we uh, don't leave anything behind here. So Ken, are you ready to share your slides? Ken was feverishly preparing the slides. So uh, he will probably be joining shortly. I'm here. Here we go. OK, great. Thank you, Ken. So um, just to remind people of the goal uh, of this um, meeting was to develop a research strategy on the use of genomic-based clinical informatics resources to improve the detection, treatment, and reporting of genetic disorders in clinical settings. So we want to make sure and focus our comments around research, research strategy, research questions, um, as opposed to doing what we all too commonly do, which is to get hung up in some of the issues relating to infrastructure and standards and that. Uh, next slide, please, Ken. As I listened to, uh, over the course of the two days, um, I pulled out what I would consider to be overarching themes uh, that came up several times and were not specific to a session. And so um, these are the overarching themes that, um, uh, that Ken and I heard. Um, research uh, should include an implementation science framework. Um, we need to work on understanding the value proposition for all stakeholders, which would include patients, research participants, providers, payers, the C-suite, researchers, uh, et cetera. And to that end, um, the NHGRI should um, support, uh, potentially convene uh, multi-stakeholder collaborations to uh, explore this value proposition to make sure that the research is relevant. We need to um, have an ongoing engagement with patients as partners uh, to develop applications that are under patient control uh, to promote genomic medicine. Um, and in particular, uh, to identify ways to lower barriers related to regulatory processes to promote research in this area. One of the ongoing challenges with consumer-focused research is that uh, the private sector can do this very rapidly. But whenever we try and do this under a research uh, umbrella, uh, we frequently get bogged down uh, in a lot of regulatory issues with IRBs and, and consents and uh, third parties, et cetera. So are there ways that we can uh, accomplish what needs to be accomplished uh, with this patient engagement uh, and still do it uh, in a timely fashion? One of the things that I think was most striking right, off, right from the get-go uh, are um, uh, the pervasive bias uh, across all aspects. And I think we... Um, initially started with the idea that, you know, there's bias in our, in our genomic databases, but I think we heard many speakers talk about bias in the data, in our information systems, in access, in, in definition of value and knowledge, and probably a number of other things. So uh, I think we have to recognize uh, the pervasive nature of the bias and make sure that we um, uh, explore that um, uh, up front. Um, and then um, the uh, last here is uh, the need to account uh, for relevant workflows, that uh, everything that we talk about uh, impacts uh, somebody's workflow. We need to understand that and we need to research it um, from the perspective of the workflow. 
Um, Pat Deverka added um, uh, that we need to develop and utilize core outcome measures to, um, to demonstrate value. I think that's uh, uh, an important point. So we'll be sure to capture uh, that. Um, Jeff had indicated our goals are aligned with the private sector. Why not include them in some way? I think that's what we're trying to get at with the multi-stakeholder collaborations. Um, uh, and um, we, we will make sure and uh, expand on that. Um, any other comments on this particular uh, slide? Yeah, Mark. Go ahead. Yeah, one just on implementation science, one thing I've observed is two very different interpretations of what that means. When I talk with some of my friends in behavioral and psychology research, they take that to mean uh, evaluating the impact of a behavioral intervention. Uh, I think in the EHR world, we see implementation science as um, how systems are implemented. So uh, as we get behind that, we'll want to be really clear on what model of implementation science we're referring to. Yeah, and um, to uh, the, the NIH actually has a, a dissemination and implementation um, a group uh, that works across the NIH on this and they have some definitions. And so I was sort of implicitly assuming that we would use um, uh, definitions uh, from the NIH around this, but that's a good point. Um, uh, and a good implementation science framework should specify all of the different uh, answers to those questions. So um, uh, that's a good point to consider. Any other um, questions on this particular slide? Mark, I just put into chat a comment about the last point on workflow. Uh, we have heard a number of different times how genomic data is uh, disrupting the practice in some ways because it is providing opportunities for clinicians and other providers to think in new ways about how they practice and what data points might be relevant in a particular situation. So existing workflows may not be readily geared towards building in the consideration of genomic data. Um, that might prevent, uh, present an opportunity for us to help develop new workflows around these data types. Um, specifically rethinking uh, the situations in which it might be most advantageous to start considering genomic data for a particular patient and think about how um, the introduction of those data uh, in those new workflows might be um, uh, a, a goal that we can work towards in the future, help shifting the clinical practice into those new workflows as opposed to trying to shoehorn um, an, an extra step into an existing workflow. Okay, and there are a couple more comments that are coming up in the chat, um, but uh, to make sure that we get through everything, um, I'm gonna, um, uh, you know, make sure we will capture those. Um, none of them, um, uh, I think uh, uh, they're pretty self-explanatory, so I don't think we would need a clarification or discussion. So Ken, let's go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, this is uh, just, uh, I'm not gonna really have any discussion on this slide. This is just a summary from the survey that I presented yesterday. Um, the key needs from the survey, research into methods for integrating analytical interpretations uh, derived from, by computer mo com computational models of genomic data into clinical settings, and then study ways to ensure that CDS has the ability to incorporate and support multiple genes and clinical information. Uh, these are a little bit, um, uh, more generic than some of the deeper discussions that we've had. Um, uh, and then a couple of the other uh, things here uh, really support some of the overarching themes uh, that we've um, uh, noted uh, uh, on the prior slide. So let's move to session one. Um, so session one, uh, there, we heard loud and clear that we have to study the inherent biases in data algorithms, information systems, and in implementation. Uh, these are multidisciplinary, multidimensional, um, and this is certainly not an exhaustive list, but ones that were explicitly discussed were uh, race and ethnicity, social determinants of health, urban, rural, 
academic, non-academic uh, centers. I think education could fit in here as well. Uh, I thought there was a really interesting uh, comment that was made about implementation equity. I think Kevin uh, Johnson uh, mentioned that. That was a term that was new to me, but is uh, I really hit home. So that's one uh, that I took away there. Uh, a second bullet, um, and I have a second slide on session one here. So um, the need to explore the value proposition, which is imbalanced between researchers and participants. And this is particularly noticeable uh, in underserved uh, populations. Uh, Ken, let's go to the next slide. We'll go through the bullets and then we'll come back for discussion. Uh, we need engagement in research across a broader range of organizations. We have a Casablanca problem, round up the usual suspects. Uh, NIH puts out an RFA and we see all the same faces, um, most of which are also on this call. Uh, and again, this concept of implementation equity. Um, we need innovative research questions and methods to address these inherent biases in a rigorous and systematic way. This was a, a really interesting point uh, that Dr. Jeff brought up. Um, and we really don't have methods right now uh, that we can roll out um, uh, to implement this. So this is gonna require some uh, research into actual uh, methods. Um, and then outcomes um, have to capture both benefits and harms. Uh, this was a specifically mentioned in conjunction with uh, genomic uh, clinical decision support uh, to inform um, some mitigation um, uh, uh, approaches. So um, across those bullets, any additional comments? Um, uh, Jeff had mentioned about literacy and numeracy. I'm going to say that's another part of the list, um, uh, and we have to be uh, make sure that we're uh, covering um, uh, uh, covering that. Uh, Rex mentioned, uh, a few, uh, yes, we will include more detail from the Desiderata and survey in the final report, but I didn't want to spend too much time uh, in the discussion uh, on that at present, unless there's a specific point that you wanted to bring up. Okay, any other uh, comments or uh, reaction to the uh, takeaways from session one? Okay, uh, <laughs> Rex can't unmute. Can somebody unmute Rex? Rex, you should be able to talk now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Ah, excellent. So um, there were just a couple of things that I thought actually resonated with some of the other things we heard in later sessions. So um, one of the comments was we needed to capture, do a better job capturing conditions across multiple genes. And I think given the broader interest in polygenic risk scores, that's something that probably should get added. Again, I'm just not sure what level you want to deal with these things. And then we did talk a little bit about um, the, in, in that session, we talked about the apparent um, inconsistency between people wanting to be able to track the actual details of the molecular test slash analysis and wanting to make sure, and on one hand, but on the other hand, wanting to make sure there wasn't too much detail in the EHR. So I, I think those need to show up at some point, but. Great. Okay, and then um, uh, could uh, somebody um, unmute Susan, uh, Suzanne Bakken, please? Sorry, I don't need to be unmuted. Uh, my chat is just disabled. I wanna be able to chat. Oh, okay. Um, so, and, and if you want to um, plop it into the Q and A, uh, that, so we we can we should be able to capture it there as well. But yeah, if we can uh, at this point um, essentially enable chat for everyone, that would be great. Gerald, I don't know if you can do that or. Yes, that has been enabled, so <laughs> they can do okay. that. Now. Everybody can chat. Yeah. And Okay. Uh, I um, wanted to add something, if that's okay. Yes. Yeah. A little hand, uh, hand raise. 
Oops. Uh, so I was just uh, wanting to add that learn the learning health system and enabling the learning health system from genomics because um, this was just a. Uh, the, in the example with eMERGE, uh, there, it enables discovery and clinic and clinical care, but that that loop was not necessarily closed completely, and so um, that's something that uh, could be added as a bullet. Great, thank you. Uh, that's really important because we did see that um, uh, figure from the strategic plan several times during different presentations. I might, uh, and we don't have to do it now, Ken, but I might. Um, uh, move that actually to an overarching theme uh, is the whole uh, learning healthcare system because I think that figure would frame uh, that discussion very well. Other reaction to um, uh, the takeaways from session one? Mark, this is Erin. I would just add for the implementation equity that I think this is going to take some outreach on our behalf, I think when these, you know, certain organizations, um, when you feel inferior over a long period of time, um, it's hard to um, be courageous and step up to the plate and, and try to go after these interesting opportunities and so forth. So I think, and that I think we, as an, you know, as a group too, we need to do outreach um, to those types of organizations that maybe are kind of missing from, um, from this group. Very good point. All right, um, hearing um, no other comments and not seeing anything else appearing in the chat, let's move on to uh, session two. Again, two slides on the takeaways here. Um, uh, use of implementation science research methods to improve implementation equity, not just research equity. There have been a number of comments that have been coming in around implementation science frameworks. Um, and so we're uh, getting some good engagement around that. And uh, I, uh, I think we'll be able to uh, address some of the uh, definitional issues that have come up uh, as we prepare the final report on this. Um, develop a patient-centered research agenda. Uh, there were a number of potential research questions that came up um, in that session. Um, authentication, privacy, security of genomic data that's successful or under patient control, uh, recontact, uh, absent clinician oversight, a knowledge requirement for different stakeholders, uh, you know, sort of what is that minimum knowledge set to be able to use the information innovative uh, enabling platforms for obtaining and returning genetic results, and the ability of a patient-centered focus to potentially reduce bias. And the next slide on session two, Ken. Um, need an updated business model of research uh, to attract a broad range of stakeholders to participate, to understand more about the incentives to implement genomic-based clinical informatics resources and tools, and research into ways to represent genomic information as structured data while minimizing uh, manual processes. Uh, that also comes up uh, a bit later from the discussion today. Um, so uh, we're now open for discussion on uh, session two. Comments, questions, additional points to make. I raised my hand, but I don't think you saw it. Um, no, the, my hand, I'm not seeing the hand raise function, unfortunately, so. Uh, yeah, I can see it, so I can call it, sorry. Okay, Ken, why don't you, why don't you take care of that then? Yeah. I just put it down, but I do still have a comment, <laughs> sorry. Um, regarding this session, I think something that I didn't emphasize enough in the 10 minutes I was given, but I think is very important is that we need to figure out certain methods to use to close that loop and do the learning healthcare system. Um, that was mentioned earlier, you, reusing genetic data that's from test results presents some methodological challenges and you need to modify the strategy um, compared to when you use research genomes. In some ways, it's a parallel problem to starting to do phenotyping in the EHR as opposed to having all your 
your um, subjects come in for an exam or something like that. So I think that figuring out methods for this reuse model would be really helpful in this case because some of the limitation of using genetic data in the clinic is because we don't know the full phenotypic implications of some of these variants. I think it's a really gonna be a very powerful place for us to learn about that. Yeah, and I think that that ties in with uh, what we heard in uh, today's um, uh, session uh, from Marilyn uh, about you know the the uh, use of this data over over the lifespan. Um, so it it that reuse question is a really um, a critically important one, uh, possibly even rising to the uh, level of an overarching uh, theme that th these um, uh, genomic data are different from most. Uh, other types of clinical laboratory data that we um, that we use on a daily basis. Go ahead, Robert. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I'd like to pick up on that point on the previous slide, uh, looking at the patient-centered research agenda. One of the things that came up a couple of different times, so I'm not sure where you'd want to capture this, is the concept of data portability. Um, I think it might fit into this topic as well, uh, but again, it was mentioned a few different places. So being able to access the data, um, break this, I think, uh, in some ways, uh, kind of a legacy mindset of the data living in only one place or under the uh, auspices of a, of a healthcare system as opposed to potentially with the patient. Um, some research as to how we can improve the portability and access to uh, genomic data that, that has a relevance across the patient's lifespan. Yeah, I think that that's a really excellent uh, research question. It was something that I didn't um, explicate under the patient-centeredness, but as I made I said in my comments yesterday, right now, at least in the United States, the patient is the only common actor uh, across the healthcare delivery system. And so if we have data that uh, is relevant to the patient, um, that data has to move with the patient. Um, and so uh, that's a really key point uh, that I think could lead to some very interesting uh, research questions. So well, Ken, as you're, as you're taking notes there, if you could just add, um, making sure um, uh, the data uh, moves uh, with the patient. Mark, sorry, I think- I, I, Go ahead. Uh, Mark, I think another thing that came up in session two that I'm not really sure how to frame it in a research context, but scalability of some of the examples that were given, that was brought up several times. And I think that it would be important to capture that in, in the summary. Thanks, Carol. Yeah, scalability, sustainability. These are ongoing issues for a lot of what we do. Uh, we can be successful over the course of a four-year uh, grant, um, but then um, it, uh, it dies there and we need to uh, make sure that uh, we build in some aspects of this uh, scalability, generalizability, sustainability. So thank you for that. Other comments? And I know we're going through this very rapidly. And, and uh, one thing I've learned in my decades of doing this is that not everybody processes information at the same speed. Um, and uh, this is uh, really um, uh, trying to react uh, while we're um, uh, inundating you with uh, information. So these slides will be uh, available. Uh, and I would encourage those of you who um, uh, would like more time to process this to um, uh, feel free to take that time and respond to uh, Ken and myself um, uh, asynchronously. And we'll make sure we, uh, we incorporate that as we pull everything together. Cause we're certainly not gonna have the report on this meeting uh, ready by next week, so. So Mark, quick, yes. quick comment on the scalability um, and sustainability piece. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, in Emerge, um, at least in the early phases of Emerge, algorithms were developed in one system and then tested in an independent system to be um, valid. And I'm just wondering if that same paradigm should be repeated here uh, as part of the research agenda that if we're developing systems uh, that are just unique to a particular place, 
it's not going to go very far. But if we can show generalizability and import them to other systems and demonstrate similar results, that would be very powerful. Yes, and of course that was an inherent feature of the network uh, where it was a requirement to be part of the network that you had to be able to do this. And so in some ways that was baked into the um, uh, uh, RFA for uh, eMERGE. Um, now that's not typically something that, you know, we require dissemination plans and data sharing plans as part of investigator initiated research. Um, but uh, how we might be able to take some of the um, imperative to have generalizability and um, you know, get away from just sort of a generic, uh, well, we're gonna publish some papers and put it in GitHub uh, so that we can actually have substantive examples of generalizability, I think would be a very interesting thing uh, for NHGRI to consider. Okay, let's um, uh, move on to session three then. Um, takeaways from session three. Uh, and again, I think I've got two slides here. Um, informatics research for genomic evidence computing and genomic knowledge based construction to enable scalable, shareable, computable inferences of genomic knowledge and harmonization of practice guidelines. Uh, that's, there's a lot to unpack there, but I think it emphasizes some of the things that we were just discussing. Uh, research into novel workflows that diminish burden for primary care providers, tap into other healthcare workers and engage patients, and don't default to alerts and reminders. So essentially innovation in the idea of how we actually present uh, this information in a clinical workflow. Uh, studies to ensure that new technologies don't exacerbate health disparities. Um, and ideally, um, actually reduce health disparities might be a more positive way to frame that. Um, educational policy research agenda to reduce barriers and improve knowledge for patients and providers. So in other words, um, research into uh, educational strategies and um, uh, policy um, uh, implications that may um, uh, uh, raise barriers for implementation could be a potential research uh, agenda for um, uh, NHGRI in this space. Next slide. I stole this from Chenhua Wang because it, it was so beautiful. So uh, the blue text are my um, modest efforts to the one that she um, uh, presented in her um, uh, talk. Uh, I just love this idea of the socio-technical strategies for success. Uh, informatics research for genomic, uh, um, um, that looks very familiar to what I just read. So I'm not gonna read it again. Um, harmonize the interests of multiple stakeholders to facilitate team science and implementation science. Incentivize collaborations to foster research on a learning health system for genomics. What is new evidence? Who is affected? What needs to be done? and clinician and patient-centered design of workflow. Um, uh, so uh, thank you, uh, Chenhua, for um, uh, providing that. Um, so comments about the um, uh, takeaways from session three. So Bob noted in the chat that, uh, as Bob always notes in uh, every setting, that uh, this depends on data representation and standards, which is absolutely true. Um, the um, uh, question then is, uh, is, there a, uh, is there a research agenda on data representation and standards? And we do get into this a little bit in sessions four and five. Um, about ways that we can actually do research around um, uh, data representation standards, as opposed to say what we always say, which is we need um, standards around this area. Um, and then there certainly is a research agenda around um, uh, knowledge delivery of the uh, complex data for, uh, for decision-making. Mark, just on that first point, um, what I was trying to get at is the, the first point on the previous slide mentioned research into genomic knowledge bases and specifically the construction of them. 
uh, my point there was uh, constructing new knowledge bases ad hoc um, with, with their own localized specialized models uh, will actually hinder interoperability. And so the new knowledge bases that we are looking for here really should be uh, pre-harmonized and standards compliant whenever possible. Great, thank you, Bob. Uh, also, um, two people have mentioned um, on the last uh, sub-bullet here, uh, more human factors uh, research. Uh, and um, the and then Terry, you had your hand up. Sure, I just wanted to make the point on your previous slide, you talked about making sure that uh, new technologies don't exacerbate health disparities. And, and we hear this a lot, and it's a very important uh, point to make. But it seems to me that clinical informatics could be key in reducing health disparities that we currently have in, in genomics in medicine. So uh, why not try to be a little more proactive about that? Yeah, and I, when I read through that, I tried to fix it on the fly, which is to say, um, you know, change that from rather than uh, try not to exacerbate to actually reduce health disparities. And I think the other point you made in the chat was that, you know, these disparities exist across uh, many more uh, areas. I captured this one specific to session three, but in the overarching goals, I tried to be a little bit more global about the idea that we really need to be looking at these types of disparities and biases in all areas that we're that fall under this um, um, this topic area. Um, Pat Deverka mentions economic uh, benefits. Again, I think we're trying to capture that in the overarching goals around value. Uh, that by having different stakeholders, we can also uh, accomplish that. But certainly, uh, there are. Uh, the NHGRI is already funding some economic evaluation uh, research uh, under the uh, auspices of the LC program. Uh, so that would be uh, important. Um, and then uh, fair principles were mentioned, which is something that should be uh, incorporated. And then I see, Guillermo, you have your hand up. So uh, go ahead. Yeah, on, on the health disparities issue, one uh, I think one point to consider is uh, the technologies that we expect patients to use in certain interventions. It's important to keep in mind, for example, that I think there's Pew research showing that among the underserved populations in the US, 25% of the people do not have access to the internet or a smartphone. They only have a text and voice. Uh, you know, oftentimes you come up with cool things like chatbots and uh, patient portals, and it, there's a large percentage of that population that won't have access. Yep. Yeah, I didn't explicitly include that in a sub-bullet, but certainly that digital divide, technological divide, is a, an important thing to consider in um, health uh, equity and disparity. Yeah, another point is insurance coverage. Uh, we had some barriers in trying to implement some of our interventions with underserved because for example, if they test positive for a BRCA, um, uh, insurance won't, uninsured won't be able to cover costs of uh, aggressive cancer screening like breast MRIs. Yeah, and that's where you know we get into the real. Um, I, I guess I'll I'll use the term, even though I really don't like the term, um, the slippery slope in terms of where where can you actually. Uh, uh, sort of impact in a in a research program, uh, as opposed to acknowledging the idea that we need to identify how the things that we think are going to improve care could actually unintentionally uh, uh, exacerbate um, some of these disparities. And so the need to capture exactly that type of information to say, hey, we facilitated all this stuff relating to identify people at risk, but in, the, in our healthcare system, uh, a lot of people don't have access to the care that they need to actually act on the information that we're providing, in which case, have we really done them a, a service? Other comments uh, regarding to session three, some really good discussion here. So just, okay, go ahead. Just the one point that um, more research involving um, modal other modalities uh, for decision support 
um, one of the things that Guillermo brought up was chat bots, for example. And so there are a lot of um, other modalities that could be explored in novel ways. Yep. Okay. And Chen Hua, I just noticed you had your hand up. So go ahead. Yeah. So I, uh, I also think we need a policy in place regarding who should be responsible for delivering and acting on this uh, highly relevant or clinically meaningful uh, genomic results. Because I feel there's still a lot of confusion there. Yes, and you've done a beautiful job of allowing me to segue into session four, because that's in fact one of the takeaways that we captured from, um, from session four. So why don't we go ahead and, and move on there for uh, given the time. Um, so um, session four, we had um, uh, some takeaways, research on what constitutes a minimum uh, data set for clinical care and research. Um, I love the phrase, um, uh, I think it was Suba that said, uh, learn from less data. Um, that's sort of a, 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 um, a paraphrase of the perfect is the enemy of good enough. Oh, what happened? Uh, there yeah. we go. Thank you, Ken. Um, uh, then research at the interface of human cognition and artificial intelligence. How can we take the best of both? Um, uh, include research into explainable AI to promote clinical implementation. Uh, and then uh, research into the development and implementation of a common semantic framework to reduce reliance on manual curation. And do we have another um, takeaway slide there on four, Ken? Yes. Um, research into data interoperability between clinical systems that is focused on the implementation of genomic medicine. Um, I thought a very powerful theme that came out of session four was a research based on specific use cases to support genomic medicine implementation through informatics, but to engage uh, with uh, the diverse stakeholders who were referenced earlier uh, to prioritize which use cases really have the most uh, resonance uh, with, um, uh, with, with the uh, diverse stakeholders so that we can make sure we're doing research on the most important questions and uh, not have something that is uh, ends up being cool, but not relevant. So Mark, uh, Mark, yes. Mark, I made a mistake. Let me switch something. That's actually, I was going to say that seemed different to me, but I was just going with, uh, okay, here we go. I appreciate you going with the flow, but yeah, this is actually session, the remainder of session four. Yeah. Okay. And then the next slide would be session five. So there, that, that, this is where the remainder for session. Okay, great. So this, this is where the point that Chen Hua had made. Research into the development of a responsibility model across the EHR for patient access to needed information, and also uh, to capture what uh, Chen Hua said, which is understanding, you know, who within the healthcare system has responsibility. Now, I did have a question. Um, uh, it came up in the chat, and um, it was raised about the idea of using 80-20 use cases. Uh, in genomic informatics. And we didn't have a chance to discuss that during the session. And I was wondering if the, um, and Ken, remind me, who had posted that first? I Maybe I'm wrong, but Lisa, was this you who posted that? Or maybe I'm wrong in that. If somebody wants to claim responsibility for that, I'd love to understand a little bit more about um, how you're thinking 80-20 use cases could be useful. I think I posted that, uh, Mark. Okay, that was in the, in the context of HL7 standards development, comparing HL7 version 3 with FHIR. Um, yeah, it's the, the idea is to identify the uh, cases that uh, cover uh, most of the uh, practical, readily available clinical genomics, things that we could do today, and that could be covered by... Uh, 20% of the standards. Gotcha. Yeah, so this is the, the thing that we frequently um, uh, end up with is that we um, develop a strategy to address a problem and we can take care of 80% of the problem, but we spend, um, we delay ourselves because we spend a lot of time consumed about the, the edge cases that don't necessarily fit, whereas we could potentially move forward on the 80%, get that to work, and then go back and try and pick up the edge cases as best we can. Is that a, a re fair restatement? Yeah. Okay, I, I like that, um, thanks. 
Okay, other uh, comments or questions about uh, session four? Mark, this is Nephi. I just wanted to make sure that somewhere, I'm not sure is the best way to address this, but to better develop regulatory frameworks to open up the use of genetic data. And I'm not sure exactly how that fits into the research world, but that's sort of a need needs, that needs yeah. to be addressed, I think. Yeah, I think that um, the um, um, we, we mentioned that in the prior session, but it can be um, uh, refined here is that um, it is within the purview of uh, NHGRI, and they have certainly done this before, to uh, research uh, regulatory frameworks and how they either facilitate or, in more cases, impair uh, implementation. And so um, that type of research uh, would certainly be within uh, the realms of consideration for, um, uh, for, for, for Gino. I just, for, for balance's sake, Ken, in your comments, just say how they facilitate uh, and impair research. Because okay. one, one might assume that there are, you know, Gina could arguably be said to uh, maybe facilitate, although there would certainly be people who would argue with me on that point. Yeah, this is, this is Terry. I, I think it, it's not only the, you know, how they may facilitate or impair research, it's, it's how they would affect clinical care and maybe affect is a more, you know, uh, benign way of saying this. Um, yeah. But, but certainly, you know, I think we've seen with pharmacogenetics that uh, the, the reports that we get now that, that basically <laughs> give you genotypes and nothing else um, are, are meaningless to patients and clinicians. Right. So that's a really good point. So um, affect research and clinical and clinical care, yeah. And Chenwa just made a point in the um, uh, chat that when we use AI, uh, we're, we may be referring to it more as augmented intelligence rather than artificial intelligence. That would certainly be an important uh, distinction to make as we throw around that term. Other comments or uh, questions about session four? Do you so, want to say something about AI and its potential to exacerbate disparities? Yeah, I think we can we can definitely fold that into the uh, point that we made uh, previously about technology and just uh, make sure that when we think about um, um, uh, technology that we also include things like uh, AI, uh, machine learning, etc. Again, this gets it back. Whatever the difference is between those two words. Well, well yeah, it, it depends on what you're trying to get funded, I think, for the most part. Um, but uh, it also uh, relates to the point that was made uh, in session one about inherent biases and algorithms that they, they don't, in fact, represent um, uh, unbiased or um, um, naive approaches to data. Um, and there was a point made, uh, Casey made a point about uh, that Gil had raised in his uh, talk, uh, uh, smart contracts um, uh, that, you know, uh, have both policy and uh, technical uh, implications. Um, and that that's one way to address a, um, a responsibility model. And Mark, I have my hand raised if you. Okay, I, I, I didn't know if it was raised from before or if you had another comment, so Somebody go ahead. Call me because I, I can't figure out how to do it. Um, so you had made an interesting point about um, synergizing uh, human and, and uh, artificial or augmented. Uh, intelligence and and it, there could be an interesting research agenda around how to do that in in genomic informatics. I, yes, I don't know what it would be, but um, but it might be. I'm, and I'm not sure if it's this session or the next session that it belongs in. Yeah, I'm, I know I I captured something. I may not have been stated so obviously. I, go to the prior slide, slide ten, Ken. I think. Oh, the interface uh, of cognition and artificial. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That. Yeah. That was the one. Right. And yeah. again, Sorry, I, I missed it. 
<laughs> well, geez, I don't know how uh, we've been going through it at the speed of a FedEx guy or the, you know, the side effects of medication ad. Right. So, all right. Uh, and a, then, little bit, a little bit clearer because, you know, interface of human cognition, artificial intelligence. But anyway. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll make sure and, and uh, just flag that to uh, uh, clarify that some. Um, Chen Wang, I'm going to get to you in just a second. Uh, Jeff Ginsburg also um, uh, mentioned that telegenomics uh, was, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I, we certainly didn't mention all of the different technologies uh, that are potentially uh, available. Uh, I would certainly think that um, uh, telehealth, telegenetics um, uh, would be within the realm of uh, technology uh, augmentation uh, for the research agenda, but we'll uh, make sure that that's included. Uh, Chen Hua? Yeah, so I just want to add a little more about that uh, responsibility model, because I, uh, I feel a lot in genomic medicine, a lot of delayed diagnosis or misdiagnosis are actually due to a poor coordination between a primary care and then a geneticist a specialist. So I'm thinking, you know, in clinical informatics, there has been a um, long time researching care, co care coordination. Uh, I'm actually thinking like for genomic medicine, we need a better coordination among all these di um, different type of care providers between specialists or, or primary care. I think that needs to, uh, that's actually critical. Um, and, uh, you know, if we can have better support between primary care and a specialist or geneticist or genetic counselor, uh, we can potentially shorten the time for diagnosis and have better uh, patient management. Um, yeah, I just want okay. to add that. Yeah, that's a very important point um, and certainly is an area of um, critical importance to uh, informatics research. And with our, as we think about our rare disease patients in particular, um, this is uh, a major issue. I, I think it was the Undiagnosed Diseases Network uh, that noted that a review of medical records alone uh, resulted in a diagnosis in somewhere between 5 and 10% of the patients that were referred to the UDN. In other words, the information about the diagnosis was there, um, but it just never, had never been communicated to the primary care physician, to the uh, patient um, and their family. So uh, a very uh, critical um, uh, point to make sure that we would include that into a uh, research agenda as we talk about data and interoperability and you know, all, all the technical things that there are these um, uh, human factors related to, to handoffs and coordination communication that also have to be considered. Okay, let's move on to session five. Um, and uh, the uh, takeaways here, um, uh, research into data interoperability between clinical systems that is focused on the implementation of genomic uh, medicine, um, develop research on specific use cases to support genomic medicine implementation through informatics and prioritize those use cases based off diverse stakeholder input, um, coordinate and synergize research findings with the broader health IT community. In other words, try and make sure that um, research findings, uh, research standards uh, that are developed are shared with um, groups like the US Core, HL7, GA4, GH, et cetera, and then um, facilitate the last mile of clinical implementation, identify what's ready and support implementation research uh, around it. Um, other takeaways from session five. Hey, Mark, this is Jeff. I, I, um, this may not rise to the level of the kinds of things that are on the slide, but I, I, I did want to reemphasize Sandy's uh, call to action with um, the leaders of systems to convene to be the end users of our research and to help us um, make sure that our research agenda is moving towards their needs, um, the C-suite people. Yes, I, I explicitly listed the C-suite people on, on the overarching theme slide. So, oh, okay, um, sorry. You it, know, it, it's okay. Again, we're going through this quickly, so it's easy to miss stuff. And I didn't capitalize the C in C-suite, so easy to miss.
either we did a phenomenal job of capturing it or we have completely exhausted the group. Oh, I, I can always count on Bob. So uh, go ahead, Bob. Uh, Mark, could you say something a little bit more about point three there, um, coordinating and synergize research findings? So this was, the, um, this was the point that came out of our discussion around implementation guides. I think Ken was talking about uh, how, um, uh, you know, we generate uh, certain things uh, in the course of projects that we uh, do, but we don't necessarily pass off um, the knowledge around some of the standards um, uh, into the standards organizations. And so I raised the question about, you know, could, would it be appropriate for, um, you know, the NHGRI to say, hey, and by the way, if you're going to be doing this types of research, you should also be uh, creating implementation guides as part of a dissemination plan. And uh, you and Ken thought that was not a great idea because um, the standards world is um, a pretty arcane uh, group of specialists. But I think there still is uh, the need to make sure that um, new things that come out of research that have implications for standards um, somehow get passed to that specialized community uh, so that they can take advantage of the knowledge, of the work that's been done. So that's what I was trying to capture there. Okay, so I, thank you for clarifying that. I certainly agree with what you just said there. I, I didn't derive all of that from the bullet point, um, but I, I like what you're saying and I would support um, adding some, some semantic around that. That basically helps to close the loop between uh, the research use cases, uh, the development of standards and the, the support of standards for those use cases, and then the downstream adoption and utilization of those standards for the next set of research. So, yeah, and you. as you said that, Bob, it really, um, it, it emphasized to me that this is a two-way street. So in other words, um, the research group that's um, working on a specific use case needs to make sure that they are aware of and use any extant standards that already exist rather than creating new standards that aren't needed. So that's yep. the front end piece, but on the back end, they may find some gaps in the existing standards that need to be addressed that they can fill. And then that needs to be handed back. So that's a little virtuous cycle in the standards world uh, that should be reflected. That's right. And in fact, I have a slide on exactly that. Um, that standards development is not linear, it is iterative, it is circular um, for the pattern that you just described there. Great, so if you wanted to um, uh, fire that uh, to Ken and me, uh, who knows, it may just end up in, uh, in, the, in the summary somehow. So Marilyn, I saw your hand up. Yeah, thank you, Mark. One point that it, it came up earlier, but I, it came up in this session as well, that I wonder in bullet two, in talking about the use cases, I wonder if being explicit about some of those use cases being the reuse of the genomic information where, for example, you know, an exome for a Mendelian gets reused for a pharmacogenomic or a panel for pharmacogenomic gets reused for a PRS or a, a Mendelian um, gene just so that we don't end up siloed, that we have implementation use cases that are in each of those spaces, but we haven't actually done the use case of reuse or integration across those different types of genomic medicine content. Great, that's a good point that we can definitely add. And then Jeff added in the chat um, uh, that we did see that um, learning healthcare system diagram, the left-hand side of that diagram is uh, the basic science. And so even though this uh, workshop was focused on uh, clinical implementation of uh, uh, genomic medicine through informatics, um, we don't want to forget the idea that, you know, sort of a, a superset of what we were just talking about in the standards world is that there's going to be additional knowledge that is generated by the implementation of genomics that's going to generate new questions that are relevant to the basic science community. So how can we uh, create that virtuous cycle to make sure that that information uh, gets back into the hands of basic science researchers to uh, facilitate their work? So um, it wasn't um, something that we really had a specific um, time set aside to discuss. But I think if we're going to use that uh, diagram as one of the anchors uh, for our um, uh, report, uh, we definitely need to say um, this is an important 
uh, piece that uh, should, um, should also be addressed. Other comments or questions? Okay, we, we are um, on time. Um, uh, this was uh, fantastic. Um, uh, obviously now uh, your, your job is, is mostly done. Um, uh, the group that's the organizers uh, will have a lot of uh, things to sift through to kind of pull this together. Um, the next steps, um, uh, obviously all of the presentations, uh, the video and everything will be posted to the genomic medicine um, uh, um, uh, meeting uh, site. So that will all be um, available to anyone who's interested. So if there are people that you think are interested that weren't able to attend, please point them uh, in that direction. Uh, we will be um, uh, looking to generate uh, a, a final report for the group um, uh, that uh, we will circulate uh, for additional feedback. Uh, that will be used um, for um, planning purposes within the NHGRI. However, we're also looking forward to um, uh, developing this uh, as a manuscript um, for um, uh, publication. Uh, the um, challenging thing with um, these um, manuscripts is that most journals are not looking specifically for a meetings proceedings type of publication. And so we'll need to reframe the information that we pulled away uh, into more of a research um, uh, type of article. Um, those of us that have been involved in these meetings have done that uh, more than a few times. Uh, we generally offer the opportunity um, for authorship to um, uh, the um, uh, group that was involved in uh, organizing the committee and also to the presenters. Uh, so we'll um, uh, circulate any manuscript around to the group. Uh, the expectation would be is if you want to be an author that you would need to uh, have a substantial contribution, uh, which at this point would include um, a critical review and comment uh, and approval of the final manuscript before submission. And um, there are a couple of you who are on the invite list, and I don't know if you're still on the call or not, uh, who actually serve in the role of um, on editorial boards. And so if any of you are uh, thinking, gosh, this would be a great article for my journal, uh, please let us know because we would love to um, uh, submit this to a journal that um, uh, would have specific interest. We're thinking the primary um, uh, journal that we'd like to go after would be a high profile informatics journal since that was the primary focus of this meeting. Uh, but we're open to uh, other alternatives that people might uh, suggest. Um, that is it from my perspective. Can any uh, other uh, final actions or closeouts before we um, uh, call it a day? Other than I just want to say thank you to uh, the Corning Center, uh, Pamela Williams, Taiji, uh, and NHGRI AV people for making pulling this all together for us. Thank you so much. This would not have been, have been that successful without your input and hard work. And to our analysts also, um, Madison, uh, Anna, and Lori for also helping uh, Captain Nos and helping with, with some of the logistics. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Ken, for mentioning that. It, it's as as big and complicated uh, as a meeting uh, as this was. It was about as seamless uh, from a technological perspective than I as I can recall. After doing a year of this, that's really uh, delightful. And again, I want to thank all of you uh, who were co-moderators, presenters, and most importantly, participants for all your input. Uh, that made the meeting uh, really worthwhile. And special thanks for, uh, to Ken for, um, uh, uh, he, he's been involved in, in, in uh, planning for this meeting on and off for what, about two years, Ken? Yeah, yeah, and uh, some, some of the co-monitors and speakers were also with me on this. So this has been almost a two year effort to get this going. So thank you so much for all of you putting up with me to help get this forward. Very good. Well, enjoy the rest of your week. And um, we look forward to hearing from you uh, uh, down the road. So, and at one point, we'll actually be able to see each other. One more thing. Pamela, how do you- In three dimensions.
how do you want people to access the slides? Uh, is, there, is there a process you want them to use? Yes, actually, I was just getting ready to chat every chat that out. Um, you guys can can um, email me. Uh, you guys all have my email address. I know because I hounded you guys for <laughs> like a month and a half. <laughs> you guys are probably going to call the cops on me. But um, so you can just email me and I will share that particular folder uh, with you or invite you to share that um, do that folder. And uh, that should give you everything you need. So, Kim, I was wondering, instead of, could, would it just be easier to just send that to the, all, all the, because we have the email list of everybody, could we just? Yeah, um, and, and I mean, I could try sending them all, I mean, unless they're asking for just one, um, but okay. they're very large files, and I'm not sure that, um, you know, Duke will allow me to do that. I know I've gotten a couple of slides from people that they've had to send it to me uh, via Dropbox or something because it was too large to send. So I, I definitely can try that, Ken. That's, you know, that's a good, your, very good idea. I defer to your judgment. I, that's fine. Uh, no, I wouldn't do that if I were you, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. All right. We can all also, this is, this is, yes, this is Teji. I'll also say that as in the past, um, the NHGRI website for this meeting historically puts the, um, PowerPoints and the uh, presentations, they link them to that website so we can also direct people there. Um, yeah. That might take a couple of weeks though. Uh, okay. Yeah, and, and I do have to get with uh, Macaulay anyway and I can discuss that with him. So maybe he, you know, can give me a, a timeline, but yeah. Thank you, Teji. We'll definitely figure it out. All right. We'll see you all. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thanks for doing this. Yep. Thanks. Bye.